we're delighted on, uh, on behalf of the organizers to uh, welcome you to this uh, poll. We have a great program. Uh, for those of you who are coming from ICML, you should think of ICML as the on-Broadway show, but this is an off-Broadway show. <laughs> and we know that off-Broadway is better than on-Broadway. <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to a great uh, four days of talks. Um, so a few remarks. Uh, we need the uh, impromptu sign-up if you want to do an impromptu session, um, which is on Sunday. Uh, yes, last session of the last session of, of the, the of all Sunday. Sunday afternoon. Sunday. Um, anything else we need to say? Just me. I'm Vital Kalman, and I approve this message. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Get to start. So it's my great pleasure to be uh, the chair of the first session on the multi arm bandit. The first session on multi arm bandit. And uh, the first talk is given by uh, Daniel Russo from uh, Microsoft Research. Okay. Thanks. It's an honor to kick off Colt. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some simple Bayesian algorithms for the best arm identification problem. Uh, at a high level, we're facing the following problem. We have this finite set of designs or options, and we don't know the quality of these designs a priori. So we're going to experiment in order to try to figure out which one is best. In particular, this experimenter is going to sequentially select designs to measure, and they're going to absorb these noisy signals of the quality of the underlying designs. Right? And the objective is to allocate this measurement effort uh, in a very intelligent way, so that after a reasonably small number of measurements, we can confidently tell you which design is the best one. Right, so this is a pretty natural problem, and it's maybe the most basic example of stochastic optimization on which many other things are built. Okay, so two motivating examples for me. One will come from the problem of website optimization. So we have many banner ads like this, we'd like to uh, choose which one we should display on our website. And so we show different versions of this banner ad to different users. We observe which one uh, has the highest click-through rate, and then we want to show that for some subsequent period of, of tries. Uh, so that's an example where we're experimenting in the real world. Another setting involves experimenting on a computer. So we maybe have some black box simulator of realistic uh, air patterns or something. And we have all of these different aircraft designs. And running a single aircraft design is extremely expensive. And so you, you plug in these different designs. You observe something about how they perform in the simulator. And because each one of these tries takes a full day or something, you want to figure out efficiently, how do I query these different designs? And so simulation optimization people study problems like this heavily. OK. So the main contributions of this work are sort of in two areas. One is algorithmic. I'm going to propose these three really simple Bayesian rules for allocating our measurement effort. And on the theoretical end, I'm going to try to establish a sense in which these very simple rules are the best thing we could do. And one thing I'm going to try to do uh, sort of in the paper and in this talk is keep these contributions as separate as possible so that a practitioner could come in and understand these rules, uh, adapt them to different settings, and they don't ever need to think about uh, limits or KL divergences in order to, to make those changes. Okay. So in math, let's think about the following problem. We have these k designs, and they have an unknown quality, each of them, encoded by this vector theta star. Right. And what we'd like to do is identify i star, which we're going to say is the unique arg max of this vector. It's the design with the highest quality. Right. So our decision maker is going to adaptively sample designs, and they're going to observe noisy, real-valued signals of the quality of the underlying designs they sample. Okay, and for this talk, I'll assume that the uh, measurement distributions are in the one-dimensional exponential family. 
So the signal we get for design i is drawn iid from a distribution here at the bottom that depends on the parameter theta i. And that's something like a Bernoulli distribution or a Gaussian distribution. OK. So the theoretical results are going to be in a frequentist setting where there's this fixed unknown vector theta star encoding the quality of the different designs. But the algorithms themselves will be Bayesian. So I start with a prior, here, theta naught, over the vector of qualities. And as I gather measurements, this gets updated to form a posterior distribution over the quality of the different designs. OK. Now, I think a really nice thing about this framework is this gives a, a rigorous way of assessing the quality, or sorry, the probability that a given design is optimal. So I can say, under this posterior, what's the chance that i is the best out of these k designs? Uh, so I'll denote that by alpha ni. It's the posterior probability assigned to this particular set, the set under which i is the argmax. And pi n is the posterior at time n. So those are two pieces of notation to remember. Okay. Now, a key thing for us, is that in a lot of natural examples, it's really easy to sample from distribution alpha n. And in some cases, it's actually pretty easy using numerical integration to compute alpha n. So we can use this thing to design algorithms. Right. Now, everything I'll propose is a variation on an idea I'll call top two sampling. So at time n, given everything I've observed so far, I think in my head, what do I think is the best design? What do I think is likely to be the best, given the evidence I've seen? And then I think, if I'm wrong, what do I think screwed me up? So what's the most likely alternative that could have been the best design? And you compute these two things, and then you flip a weighted coin to decide which of the two you should play. As you continue, the top two designs change, and so you end up measuring everything. And we want to think about cases, ways of defining algorithms like this under which the proportion of time you spend measuring the best designs, the, each of the possible designs, is going to be asymptotically optimal. Right. So one variant of this is where I use these optimal action probabilities uh, to define the top per player and the second top design. So IN is the design I think has the highest posterior chance of being optimal, and JN is the second most likely. Uh, another variant I'm not really going to go into in talk is a value-based assessment of uh, the, the quality of these designs. So it assesses not only the likelihood that a design is the best, but also the expected magnitude by which it exceeds other designs. Okay. And the last one is going to build on Thompson sampling. So as an interlude, I'm going to tell you what Thompson sampling is, and then I'll define the top two variant of this policy. OK. So Thompson sampling is a Bayesian algorithm for the multi-arm bandit problem that's gotten uh, a lot of attention over the past uh, several years, including from many people in the audience and myself. And the basic idea is to sample actions according to the posterior probability that they're optimal. So in particular, I play a sample from this distribution alpha n, encoding the likelihood that each action is the best one. A completely equivalent definition, which is how people usually implement the algorithm, is that I draw a sample of this vector of qualities from the posterior distribution, and then I play whichever design had the highest quality under this sample. So I guess the truth, and I play according to the guess. Okay. Now, it turns out that this algorithm has very poor performance for the best arm identification problem. Um, and if you think for a while why this would be, it becomes pretty clear. As the posterior concentrates, so let's say I have a 95% chance under my posterior that I think alternative 1 is the best alternative. Then only 1 in 20 times will I, will I sample anything other than the first design. 
So I'm really not refining my knowledge about the other ones at a very high rate. Okay. So as a result, it takes a very long time for this posterior to really definitively converge on one thing. Now, top two sampling is just going to directly avoid this problem by not allowing the, post the sampling probabilities to concentrate too much. So here I define to be the first sample from Thompson sampling. And the next uh, top guy is the first sample from Thompson sampling that differs from the top sample. Right, so I keep running Thompson sampling until I get two distinct uh, actions out, and I flip a weighted coin to decide which one to play. Okay. Now, I'm going to establish some kind of optimality uh, result for these algorithms, and it's going to pertain to the rate at which this posterior distribution concentrates. So here I have the, I guess, a real simulation trial. I have the posterior probabilities assigned to five different designs um, after one measurement has been taken. Okay. Now, in this simulation, the real best design is option five. Okay. So now, after 100 measurements, you can see you're starting to concentrate on the fifth one being the best. 400, you're getting much more concentrated. And at 500, you're all. Now, a natural question to ask is, if you look at those other four designs, and you look at the total mass assigned to those four, that's going to zero. And can you prove that it goes to zero? And can you say something about whether the rate at which it goes to zero is better than it would be under some other way of gathering information? Sort of exactly what this paper does. So it shows that under the proposed rules, the total mass assigned to all of the suboptimal designs goes to zero, and it goes at an exponential rate. Then we look at the exponent and characterize sort of what that is and say that that's the best it could be under any other allocation rule, in a formal sense. So more formal theorem essentially says that under some regularity conditions, we get the following large deviations result. Joe? Uh, so it's not good to me whether you're in a Bayesian setting or in a frequentist setting. Frequentist setting. Okay, good. Yes. So this, this vector of designs, oh, I'm supposed to repeat questions. OK. So uh, the question was whether we're in a Bayesian setting or a frequentist setting. Uh, I'm just going to assume some grain of truth uh, style prior and show that under any fixed vector of qualities, uh, the posterior converges on the truth at the fastest possible rate. So it's like you can take the first theta vector and this is a still As long as there's an appropriate gap, any fixed theta vector, then you take So for any fixed theta vector, there is an exponent gamma star under which no algorithm could converge at rate faster than e to the negative n gamma star. And if you tune this beta properly, you exactly recover that rate. In fact, there, then we have results about how a sort of even a heuristic choice of beta, like beta equals 1 half, will give you within a constant of this rate. OK, so what is gamma star? Well, I'm thankful here that I'm, I can basically just defer to the next talk to define gamma star. So this gamma star has appeared in similar ways in some past work. Uh, I learned a lot by going through this uh, classic paper by Chernoff on the sequential design of experiments. Um, there's a paper by Glynn and Junasia in uh, the simulation optimization literature that characterizes something like this. And from this cult, we'll see a different best arm identification problem in, under which the exact same exponent uh, arises. Right. Um, so instead of going through exactly what gamma star is, I just want to give you the main intuition for why these algorithms might do the best thing. So I want to contrast an equal allocation with gathering equal evidence. 
So instead of allocating equal measurement effort to each design, it turns out that the optimal algorithm adjusts measurement effort so that the rate at which it gathers evidence to rule out all of the suboptimal designs is exactly equal. Now, why does top two sampling do this? It's because if I haven't gathered enough evidence about any suboptimal, then that thing looks like it has a decent chance of being optimal. So I naturally go in and sample all of these things to which I haven't gathered enough evidence. And I automatically adjust the measurement effort allocated to these designs until they come to the level. So I can show you a simulation experiment in which some of this uh, really pops out. Let's look at a, a trial where there are Bernoulli rewards and the success probabilities are encoded by this vector, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, up to 0 0.5. So the best design is, is design 5. Now if you continue until the posterior concentrates until different levels, you can see that all the proposed algorithms are stopping in something like half the time that a uniform allocation requires, even in this simple example. And then you can see what they're doing differently. All of the three proposals allocate much less measure the first design than the second, than the third, and so on. So most of the measurement effort is spent on things that are very nearly optimal and are hard to distinguish from the best. In fact, if you look at the log inverse posterior, so here, this is something the magnitude of evidence I have against the design being optimal, those are all completely equal for uh, the allocation rules we've proposed. So they're gathering an equal amount of evidence to rule out each of the four four bad designs, but under a uniform allocation, you gather an enormous magnitude of evidence that the Bernoulli of 0.1 is not the Bernoulli of 0.5, but much, much less evidence that the Bernoulli of 0.4 is less than the Bernoulli of 0.5. Okay. So really, the best you can do is just adjust these levels so that the effort allocated is equal, and some very, very simple rules automatically do that. That's the takeaway. Okay. With that, I'll move to the next talk. Thanks, everyone.